Good day. Today is the 9th of January and uh, we're looking at true spirituality. Our passage is Acts chapter 8 verses 14 to 17. It says the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had received the word of God so they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived they prayed for the believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit for the Holy Spirit had not yet come down on any of them. They had only been baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Have you ever thought carefully about that strange passage we just read? The Samaritans believed and were baptised but hadn't yet received the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Any ordinary Christian will tell you when you believe, you receive the Holy Spirit and you get baptised to indicate that faith. Yet what happened to the Samaritans is quite contrary to that pattern. The passage is an important key to true spirituality and if you're on Facebook you will know how important the quest for spirituality is for many people. In fact, the quest is part of what for centuries people have searched for. The rich ruler asked Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Martin Luther preached, how do you find a gracious God? People were desperate to answer that. These days people post their anxieties on Facebook and Quora. They ask, will Gnosticism help my mental health? Why don't people take Arius more seriously? You know, Arius was a famous heretic. Will God pour out his wrath on the church during the Great Tribulation? I try to answer some of these. I tell them that, if not, that Gnosticism isn't concerned about mental health because that belongs to the body and that and Gnosticism considers the body unimportant and corrupt, the cause of all that is wrong with us and something to deny. I say don't worry about the Great Tribulation, turn back to Jesus leaves speculation to people with itching ears. I say that Arius breaks the link between God and humans and offers no hope for a sinner bound for creation's junk heap. Yet these questions persist because people want a personal relationship with God. They want peace of mind and a sense of completeness. And that's found in the spirituality offered by Jesus. The book of Acts regularly reports people believing and receiving the Holy Spirit. This is Holy Spirit spirituality. Consider Acts 2, the famous Pentecost passage. The disciples are gathered, the Holy Spirit suddenly comes on them, they speak in tongues, they are believers, but unbaptized. Then the gospel spreads from Jerusalem and Judea to Samaria. Here the people see healings and deliverances. They believe in Jesus and are baptised. Then the Holy Spirit comes on them, but only after Peter and John come and lay hands on them. We don't hear what evidence there was for the Holy Spirit, but Simon, a magician who watched, was greatly impressed. Next, in chapter 10, Peter visits the Roman Cornelius. Peter outlines the gospel and those unbaptized, uncircumcised Gentiles spontaneously believe and receive the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues like on the day of Pentecost. Peter's message boiled down is God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and power. He, and he went about doing good and healing. He was crucified, but God raised him from death. He was seen by many witnesses. Jesus is the one appointed to judge the living and the dead. The prophets testify about him. Everyone who believes in him ha receives forgiveness of sins through his name. When these Gentiles believed and received the Holy Spirit, they began speaking in tongues and praising God. Peter ordered them to be baptised. Finally, in Acts chapter 19, Paul finds a group of disciples in Ephesus, but they're obviously not disciples of Jesus. Paul said, John told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Again, the pattern. Belief, baptism, Holy Spirit. The Spirit is evidenced by speaking in tongues and prophecy. And we see in these examples that God isn't as concerned about strict patterns as we are. Some people believe in Jesus, are baptised and receive the Holy Spirit. Others believe in Jesus, receive the Holy Spirit and are baptised. The key truth is that a satisfying spiritual life is not found in anything unavailable to the ordinary masses. It only comes through trusting Jesus. Personally, I first understood that Jesus died for me through a school scripture class. The Reverend Dickie Barton, a retired children's evangelist, challenged us about our response to Jesus, and I knew I should give my life to him. But I didn't. So God stopped waiting for me and sent Mrs Cook around to invite our family to a baptism at the Baptist church. My mother, my brother and I stayed. Eight months later, after resisting the gospel challenge every Sunday night, I gave in to Christ on the Goulburn Street footpath in Sydney beside the open-air campaigner's van. Eventually I was baptised, I read my Bible, I prayed, I studied, but I was dissatisfied. There was a dryness. My Pentecostal cousin Michael was doing carpentry for my father. He arrived early every day so he could leave early and catch the first workers off the afternoon trains. He preached and handed out tracts. He seemed to have a satisfaction I lacked, though I disagreed with his theology about the Holy Spirit. I began praying that God would do a new work in me. This is where many Baptists get edgy because we're taught believe and you receive the Holy Spirit, then get baptised and everything is sorted out. And while I got edgy about what my cousin was saying, I saw his attitudes and his confidence that God was doing something new in his life. Then the Holy Spirit was renewed in a woman I worked with. One of my co-workers said Faye used to be so flat, now she seems to be on happy pills. She was transformed. So many people want changes. They try meditation or medication, organic foods or yoga, but what do they get? How do you transcend yourself by accessing only what is in yourself? There's nothing wrong with meditation. The psalmist meditated on God's word day and night. There's nothing wrong with eating well or looking after your body. There's nothing wrong with self-examination. The Greek philosopher Socrates said, know yourself. Paul told us, let a man examine himself. If we do that properly, we not only count our sins, but we look at what drives us and leads us to do what we do. But a spirituality from within is as limited as we ourselves are and less valuable than a photo of a one cent coin. Sadly, Christians get sucked in instead of going to Jesus and the scriptures. Only what comes from outside ourselves can lift us beyond ourselves. Anything else is illusory. Paul warns the Colossians, since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to this world, do you submit to its rules? Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such reg regulations indeed have the appearance of wisdom, with their self-imposed worship, their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. All systems based on what is destined to perish are merely human commands and teachings. We must return to the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised another comforter like himself, the Holy Spirit. Receiving the Spirit is not based on whether we're baptised or not. We saw that already. Yes, Christians should be baptised in obedience, but that's not the point. Do we trust Jesus and is the Spirit active in our lives? I struggled with that question for so long, yet we were discouraged from struggling with it in our church. They worried we might start saying things they didn't understand. For goodness sake, what difference does it make if, for example, 
I pray the Lord's Prayer in Old English or say something even less intelligible in tongues. Either way, no one understands, but it's harmless. Yet they were so scared of speaking in tongues that they were scared of the Holy Spirit. Dare we throw out the Spirit just to avoid something strange or unusual? So I return to this question. How do we find a spirituality that truly comes from God if we're supposed to have it already yet feel we haven't? I found the answer in a book about a revival among Catholic students in the 1970s. Catholics, of course, believe remarkably like Baptists. They say that you receive the Holy Spirit right at the beginning, except they say that the beginning is when you are baptised as a baby, and we say it's when you trust Christ as an adult. They said the Spirit is present, but his gifts need to be released. They said, it appears like you've suddenly received the Holy Spirit, but from God's perspective, it's about turning what is potential into something actual. And that makes sense. Kevin Ranahan set out basic biblical principles for the renewal of the Spirit's work. All I add is that we should be prepared to keep on praying. As Jesus says, go on asking and you'll receive. Go on seeking and you'll find. Go on knocking and the door will be opened. Formulas don't necessarily give answers. I prayed for months until I was ready to receive rather than tell God what I wanted from him. As the old Austrian said, das Geheimnis ist, beten, beten, beten. The secret is pray, pray, pray. As I remember the Ranahan's book, the steps were as follows. You can use them when you're ready to let the Spirit work freely in your life. First, acknowledge Jesus as Lord and consciously submit to his rule. The Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Second, confess known sin and request forgiveness. The Bible says if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. It also says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Third point is, in the name of Jesus, resist any evil spirits. Command them to be gone in his authority because we want only to be open to the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Ask to be filled with the Spirit so he can renew all his work in your life. Paul says, be filled with the Spirit. Jesus said, if you being evil know how to give your children good things, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So obey the instruction and receive the promised gift. Finally, trust that God has answered and thank him for fulfilling his promise. It may not feel different, but it will begin being different, which is the important bit. Just remember what Jesus says, when you ask, you must receive and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person shouldn't expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. I'm not here to discuss my own experiences, though I can say that at last I knew the Spirit was working afresh in me, and many of my attitudes changed from that day as well. I do want us all to experience the Spirit afresh. As soon as you're ready, he's ready. As individuals, we can all be renewed in the Holy Spirit. As a group, we can be revived. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, give us the desire and the perseverance to go on seeking the fullness of your Spirit. May the life of the vine flow fully in each of us individually and in all of us corporately. And may we be revived to serve you in the power of the Spirit of life. For your glory we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to like and to subscribe using the link down in the bottom corner.